Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is uh, Community Matters. We're talking about the community today. We're going to talk about Hawaii's doctor shortage, and we're doing that with full understanding that the legislature begins very soon, and there's some bills that could help. And to discuss the status of the doctor shortage, the health care shortage, um, and the bills that could fix it is Scott Grosskreutz. He's a radiologist. We call him Dr. Scott. <laughs> John Wyhey calls you Dr. Scott, um, and uh, we're going to discuss these things with him to catch up on what's been happening and what will happen, hopefully, one way or the other, I suppose, in the legislature in 2024. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here, Jay. Uh, remember the Hawaii Provider Shortage Crisis Task Group, a group of uh, medical uh, those in the medical leadership across the state, pretty much on every island. And we have uh, docs and nurses and APRNs and PAs. And uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to uh, work together to find some solutions to the kind of the chronic access to care problem that Hawaii has. I want to just say that it seems to me harder and harder to get an appointment uh, with my primary or with um, you know any number of specialists. And I say to myself, okay, I can, I can, I can get through that. You know, nothing. There's no crisis here, but it takes longer. Um, and then I say to myself, suppose this got worse, then it would take longer still, wouldn't it? Uh, or I wouldn't be able to do it within the time I need to do it to deal with the health issue. Um, so we, I think, we have a problem that everyone in the state, at some level, you know, can understand. But do they? Well, there's, uh, there's plenty of information and data out there from national surveys, Jay, that, that we do have uh, some of the worst access to care in America. There was a Santa Benefit study that took a look at how many people in, of each state, what percentage, live in a health professional shortage area. And that's where there's more than 3,000 persons per primary care provider. Uh, and Hawaii was far and away the worst. We had 35.6% of the Hawaii population last year in one of these health professional shortage areas, and that's over half a million people. Um, and this is not like most states where you can get in your car and drive to the next city easily or the next state, you know, to seek some place where you can find somebody to take care of your health care problem. When you have a problem, particularly in Hawaii's rural areas and the neighbor islands, uh, it becomes, you know, very expensive to try to find someone on another island or fly to the mainland for care. So, you know, I see you, Scott, as the leader or at least one of the few doctors who is a leader um, to try to make the public aware, make make the, the powers that be aware of this problem and try to fix it. Why are you doing that? Is it to make a lot more money? <laughs> well, I'm going to get kind of long in the in the tooth here, Jay. Uh, I, I'm just about ready to hit 67 in a few months. and. Uh, you know, part of that is, uh, you know, just selfish, to be honest. I, you know, as, as I get older and, and uh, develop health care issues, you know, I want to have somebody take care of me and my family. Um, I see an awful lot of our patients that, uh, especially on the neighbor islands, we have so many of us that are past retirement age still working because there's no one else to, to care for our patients, basically. And so a lot of my friends and neighbors will not have anyone to take care of them. Uh, and then I also have a daughter who's... Uh, uh, dermatologist and surgical specialist that takes care of skin cancer and does plastic procedures uh, to try to repair advanced cancers. Um, and I would love for her to be able to come back to the state of Hawaii where, you know, it made sense for her to do so. And so I've got a, I've got a couple reasons that uh, are selfish that, you know, I, I kind of want to see this thing fixed. Yeah, well, when you, when you try to advocate to her to come back to Hawaii, we should all be in the room. And we should all be saying to her, come back. We love you. We want you. We'll make a path for you. We'll make a, a sweet career for you. We have to tell her that. Not only her, but all the people from Hawaii who went to medical school and all the people on the mainland who, who would like to, you know, practice in Hawaii. So I feel, um, you know, that there's a question as to whether we're uh, offering her that kind of comfort. Are we? Well, we, we've made some progress in the last year. So Governor Josh Green and the legislature uh, are, are taking serious steps, you know, with the urging of the University of Hawaii and others to expand the number of training slots, you know, at the Jabson Medical School and also for nursing students, which is a good thing. And there's also some plans to help 
with loan repayment for healthcare professionals, because often if you are in training, you can graduate with, with debt burdens that can easily exceed a quarter million dollars. Uh, and you have to pay those off. And and so you have a lot of you know people coming out of, well, say you're, say you're becoming a medical specialist and you're going to do your four years of college, your four years of medical school, your year of internship, your three to five years of residency, and often one to two years of fellowship. So you're not actually entering the workforce until you're in your your 30s, your early 30s usually. And so at that point, you know, you could be in debt hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, you know, you have, don't have a dime in savings. Uh, you have nothing for retirement. And you have to find a state or a place that you can work and earn enough to pay back all those medical loans and, you know, and maybe put something away for retirement and also be fiscally viable. Um, so one of the, the, the challenges that I see here is I, I think a lot of these things that are happening are, are very well intended and, uh, and are a good start. Uh, I, I have a friend who's on the task force who's uh, uh, of Native Hawaiian ancestry, and she went through the University of Hawaii Family Residency Program and actually trained with us in Hilo. Um, so she was one of the residents that, that was there when I was there as, uh, during my time as chief of staff and other, you know, working there. And so we... Uh, you know, fantastic position, you know, very hardworking, wants to, you know, to improve the local community and provide access to care. So over the last year or so, when, when two of the senior uh, family practice providers on the island of Molokai died, uh, I think they were in their 70s or 80s, and, and they died and there was a big, you know, deficit. So she went in, you know, on her initiative and started up a clinic. Uh, their primary care clinic. And and unfortunately, she she's telling us that, uh, you know, it's 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 very difficult to keep that open, and the probability is is quite high that that clinic will fiscally fail. So, if we are encouraging our young people to go into training and to dedicate, you know, a decade and a half or more of their lives in, into becoming, you know, healthcare professionals, and then we're encouraging them to go out to the rural areas and the neighbor islands to go to the communities that really need their care, to have them go out and and start that. Uh, often taking out additional loans of hundreds of thousands of dollars or, or more to start these clinics up and then have them financially fail, that just doesn't make a lot of sense. And that's one of the things we have to fix. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. It's not just that uh, having a, a big loan out there that will follow you all the days of your life um, is a problem. Uh, and it's, it's I guess it's not just that you may not be able to get into medical school. It's that the whole picture to somebody graduating or even starting college, the possibility of being a doctor ain't so attractive. It really isn't so attractive. They have trouble making money, trouble doing business, trouble dealing with the bureaucracy, the loans. Um, and it's no fun. I mean, unless you feel otherwise, you tell me, there's no fun being in medical school. It's, uh, it's, it's like law school. It's not fun. So you have it, to go through a certain gauntlet to get there. Um, and and then you find uh, it, it isn't fun practicing either. So my my problem is this, you know, there was a time I don't know if you remember that people talked about Hawaii as the medical center of the Pacific, the kind of Mayo Clinic of the Pacific, where we would be awash in doctors and specialists, and they would come from continents around to take advantage of our medical expertise because we were awash in doctors and specialists. That isn't the case, is it? And, and I think we lost on that possibility. It's not here anymore. But it could be, should be, would be, don't you think? It could be. Um, on the last year, I've had some conversations with Vicki Cayetano, and she was talking about some of the countries in the world that you know are basically, they have got top-notch medical centers and programs, and, and they've got enough excess that you know people come to that area for treatment, like medical tourism. Uh, and, you know, that's certainly possible. I mean, Hawaii is well positioned, you know, to, to, to do something like that. It's just basically having a business environment that allows you to have enough people first to take care of your own population and then other people that might want to come here. And uh, so one of the things that has kind of happened uh, that was reported by University of Hawaii Area Health Education Center last year in the 2023 report was that there was a slight improvement in the number of uh, doctors on, on 
in Honolulu County, where basically the shortage, you know, improved from 15 percent to 13 percent. But on the neighbor islands, it's gotten substantially worse. The number of doctors on Maui, it went from a, a 40 percent shortage to a 43 percent shortage. The Big Island went from 20 or it went from a 37 percent shortage to a 41 percent shortage. Kauai went from a 26 percent shortage to a 30 percent shortage. And it's, it's really tough to practice when you're missing a third to half of your doctors, and especially we're short of APRNs and nurses and everybody else. And so it just, it puts a lot of stress on the system. Um, and so while some things have gotten slightly better, we're still, you know, we, we probably have about 3,000 providers, you know, or doctors that are working that are, you know, full-time equivalents. And we're missing, you know, about 700 or more. Uh, of, of those folks. And, you know, unfortunately, nobody lives forever. And a lot of, uh, a lot of my, my colleagues on the neighbor islands are, are again, they're, they're in their late 60s, they're in their 70s, sometimes 80s. Uh, and we're losing some of those folks. And that, that's unfortunate because there's just no replacement that's there for them. Yeah, and others leave town. And, you know, it's part of the doctor shortage, isn't it? They, they, they get frustrated, they get disappointed, they take off, right? Yeah, I, I, I probably have seen at least 100 uh, doctors and, and more nurses that have been on the Big Island, you know, during my time here that have, you know, come here, moved, been practicing, you know, love their, their, their patients, love the area, and they just couldn't make it work. And so they left. Uh, we just had uh, the two largest urgent care and primary care uh, centers on the North Shore of Kauai, a pretty isolated area. You know, both went bankrupt and closed their doors uh, in the la you know, this fall. We had three medical clinics burned to the ground in the Maui fires. We have uh, pretty much every larger physician group were, you know, uh, on, on the Big Island of Hawaii is, uh, or, or clinic, you know, is, is in real trouble and, and may not be around long. I, I think it's, it's, it's quite possible that many of the small, you know, practices in, in private practice, you know, small businesses, um, they're just not going to make, may be able to make it work and will probably be gone in two to five years. But don't they consolidate? Don't they get picked up by the hospitals? Are the hospitals picking them up? Are the hospitals giving them a, a, a cloth mother, so to speak, you know, to take care of them when they, when they would like to leave the, the, the trouble of private practice and, and get under the wing of a hospital? Yes, some are. And actually, Jay, that's, I see that as a good trend. We've had a number of, uh, of folks. One of our, our recent chiefs of staff at the hospital uh, was uh, a doctor who was a, a surgical specialist. And she was losing money, uh, and uh, and basically was going to leave the island. And then, uh, you know, Heal Medical Center was able to hire her and bring her on staff. So she stayed in Hawaii, which you know I think is you know I'm, I'm very grateful for. Uh, the, the challenge, though, of course, is you know about 67 percent of our rural hospitals are are losing money, you know, or at financial risk. That's the highest level in the country. So many of our our hospitals are at, at, kind of you know in, in real danger, maybe having to close. And then, of course, you know, when, when when these providers are hired by the hospital system, they're often losing money, and you know they'll go to, you know to the state legislature and ask for taxpayer monies to keep them afloat, you know, for the next year. So it's some of it. It's kind of a, a you know. You know, you're you're just kind of um, playing a, a game, or you're you're moving funds around because it isn't viable to practice in the state of Hawaii, which is unfortunate and it's unnecessary. And it, the reason that it it's it's so difficult to practice here is, you know, the first thing, of course, like every business, whether you're a hardware store or whether you're a grocery store, your costs are very high. Um, the second is that the reimbursements from uh, Medicare are, are are rock bottom. They're right at the lowest. They, they don't take into account the fact that Hawaii is much more expensive to practice in than other states. Um, and the same thing is true for local health uh, insurance companies. They also pay some of the lowest rates in the country. In some cases, they're paying fee for service doctors and 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 APRNs, et cetera, less than than Medicare rates, which is basically a death sentence in our state. Um, and then finally. The state, there's only two states in America that tax you, you know, substantially when you're sick or ill. Uh, so only New Mexico and the state of Hawaii tax you if you break your hip, if you're a senior, or they tax you if your kid, you know, develops leukemia. Other states just don't do that. They consider that regressive. Uh, they, they, 
you know, often if, you know, if you're sick yourself, you can't even pay your medical bills, let alone the additional taxes. So other states don't do that. And then Hawaii is the only state in America that taxes Medicare, Medicaid, and TRICARE programs. Um, and since those, those are not, generally those are not passed on to the patient, you know, the healthcare providers uh, absorb that. And so uh, basically if you're taking care of, say, somebody on, on Medicare and you're breaking even or losing money, then the state comes in and goes, whatever you had from your gross revenue for caring for that patient, for repairing their heart valve or giving them a vaccine or whatever else it would be, we're going to charge you, you know, whatever, 4.5%, but that's on the gross. And often that's like a 15 to 20%, you know, loss of, of net revenue. And that's, that's enough to push a lot of practices into bankruptcy. You made a lot of points and I want to respond to some with my reactions. The first reaction is, um, you know, we don't have a ferry. Um, flying to a neighbor island is expensive. Um, there are a lot of people who think that, aside from the medical issue, life on the neighbor islands ain't bad. But when they address that issue for themselves, they say, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to the neighbor islands because when I get older, I'm going to need health care. And there isn't enough of it for me there. So I mm, cut that decision, not going to do it. This is tragic. It's tragic for the neighbor islands. They could have population as well as medical care and people, you know, finding comfort in, in the level of care. The other thing that the other reaction I have um, is that if you deplete uh, the industry, the number of doctors and healthcare workers, then it just seems to me, and this is Aristotelian and symbolic logic I am giving you now. <laughs> If you deplete the size of the industry, you are going to deplete the quality of health care for the individual member of the community. And so if you're a policy person like a legislator or a governor or the director of the health department, what you have to do is you have to throw resources at this because it's mission critical. It's mission crit critical for the state for the distribution of population around the state, for the good and welfare of everybody in the state, you must actually throw resources. And if you throw more resources at it than you actually need, that's okay, because you have to get back to parity. You have to get back to the Mayo Clinic of the Pacific. At least you have to get back to a feeling of comfort and confidence by everybody in the state. We don't have that now. Uh, yeah, and I think a, a growing number of, of our leadership in the state are, are starting to, to really think about this, Jay, and looking for solutions. We just had the uh, state uh, director of uh, health development and planning agency, SHIPTA, uh, Dr. John Lewin, who goes by Jack Flew over and uh, met with Mayor Mitch Ross, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we had a very good conversation, and uh, and basically we were just talking about those things. You know, there's uh, you know Governor Green has got you know a, a goal not to, to you know to have no no shortage of doctors or nurses you know uh, w within his term, and you know I think that's highly commendable. It's just a question of you know how do you make that happen? We had Congresswoman Jill Takuda uh, flew out to meet with our tax force about ten days ago. And I, you know, I was very encouraged by her level of understanding of, of the problems that we're facing. So she's going to be working uh, as best she can in Washington, to try to get you know Medicare rates up to the point where people can you know have a medical practice and not lose money. Uh, the other thing is both uh, the congresswoman and Dr. Lewin they they both strongly agreed that it just didn't make any sense at all to have the worst you know healthcare provider shortage in America. And then to be the only state that's taxing the providers into bankruptcy for caring, you know, for our, you know, our seniors and those in economic need and our veterans, that just doesn't make any sense. And in last session, we did introduce, you know, we helped to introduce some bills uh, to basically exempt, you know, those areas of health care from the state's general excise tax. And the, the Hawaii State Senate passed the bill uh, without a, unanimously. And every House and Senate committee that heard the bill passed it without a no vote. That's the second time that's happened in the last several years. So, you know, you basically have unanimous uh, support to pass these bills. Um, and 
they still don't pass. It's just, it's, it's kind of, uh, kind of mind boggling. Well, it's a disgrace because obviously when people need it, want it, the state needs it, wants it. Um, even most of the legislature needs it, wants it, and yet it doesn't pass. And very hard to understand and, and rectify that. So um, I assume that bill is going to be back in play uh, in only a few days in the 2024 legislature. Yeah, our understanding is that there's going to be another bill uh, introduced that's, you know, fairly much the same thing. You know, let's let's stop, you know, taxing people, you know, punitively so that they're unable to practice in the state of Hawaii. And the only committee that has refused to hear the bill was the, the state finance uh, committee or the House Finance Committee, rather, where they declined to even hear the bill. I, I think if the bill was heard, there would be support and votes to pass it. But in the state of Hawaii, uh, committee chairs can just simply uh, kill any bill by, by refusing to even talk about the bill, regardless of the level of support from other lawmakers and from the general population. So, you know, I, I hope that it's heard. Um, I think I think the argument is just that if you give an exemption for one thing, you'll give an exemption for others, even though there's numerous exemptions from the state general excise tax already on the books. And as a matter of fact, if you're a healthcare provider working for a a federal health system or uh, any of the hospitals we have in the state or for HMSA or for Kaiser, you're not taxed to get. So the only the only GE tax in, in, in the state is is on primary is on primary care and private practice folks, uh, which is unfortunate. And of course, the, the thing that just is is very confusing is that once once we eliminate all the small businesses that are providing medical care and dental care. Uh, particularly on the neighbor islands and on the North Shore of Oahu and and uh, and and the uh, the leeward side. Once you eliminate all those providers and they you're, you push them into retirement or push them to leave the state, there will be no tax revenue from the get. There will be nobody left to tax. And of course, you'll also when those when those doctors and nurses leave, you'll lose the the corporate taxes they were paying. You know the individual income tax. You know the property taxes. Uh, the get you know, tax on everything that they would have bought every time they went to Costco. So it's it's just, it's it almost seems suicidal in my opinion, because you're just, you're eliminating a tax force while at the same time you're eliminating a significant portion of the Hawaii healthcare system. It's tragic. Um, and um, gee whiz, I, you know, I'm, I can't imagine why the finance committee wouldn't hear that bill. I hope you can put pressure on them. I hope somebody can, you know, who... Who is opposing it? Is, is it the tax people opposing it? Who in the world would oppose better medical care for the whole population? Who would, Who is that? Well, I, I don't think it's the Department of Taxation at this point. I mean, there's some confusion about this. For, for many, many years, the Department of Taxation on the website said that, that doctors and APRs, could, et cetera, could take the GET tax and pass it on to their Medicare patients. Uh, unfortunately, that's viewed by the federal government is Medicare fraud. Uh, and so we were able to have that dialogue and the Department of Taxation, you know, realized that that, that was a problem, that, that we, we can't be encouraging people to put their licenses at risk by, by doing that um, and, you know, getting involved in a fraud, you know, investigation. Uh, and they did submit testimony uh, last year uh, where they didn't oppose it. They said, Let's, this, is, this is how it would work and this would cost. And uh, so they... I don't think the Department of Taxation is is blocking it or, or opposing it at this point. I think it's just a matter of the House Finance Committee, uh, unlike the Senate Finance Committee, they just have decided not to uh, waste them easily. They have decided not to hear the bill. And I, I, to be honest, I think this is something where you know individual families need to weigh in on. You, you need to write you know, the members and the chair of the House Finance Committee because if you have um, if you have an OBGYN in private practice, or your kids have a pediatrician, you know, or you've got an APRN or a doctor who's your primary care provider, um, you will probably not have that provider in just a few years. They'll probably gone. Uh, and and write write them, you know, write them to say, you know, I I I like my 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 doctor. I like you know my APRN or my PA. I want I want these people to continue to care for me. I want my kid to have a pediatrician. You know, I. The, the, there's such a shortage on the neighbor islands. There, there's many, especially specialties. There's many specialties where there's a 40 to 100 percent shortage on Maui 
and the Big Island especially, where there's just nobody there. And uh, unfortunately, what ends up happening is that we have a lot of members of our community that simply can't afford to fly, especially if you have to go many times, you know, over, over to Oahu to see see somebody over there. And a lot of times they just don't seek care at all. Um, my friend who provides uh, care on, on Molokai says a lot of the population there has just become, they just accepted it. Uh, they become fatalistic or stoic about it. We're listen, we just don't have care. We're going to live and die here on this island. And many times there will be no one here to help us, which is, I mean, when you think about it, it's just tragic. It is tragic. And the emphasis on the word die, they die early. They, they die in pain. They die without solutions that could be available elsewhere. Um, and, and that's just awful. That's tragic. Life expectancy is affected. And let me, let me say, too, in terms of life expectancy, we have, a, we have a, an hourglass bubble coming in where there's a lot of elderly people. People are getting old, as they are everywhere. Um, and and, and it, they, for them, every dollar means something. Uh, for them, they get sick. Uh, for them, if they don't get care that helps them, they will die early. And um, it, it seems um, really tragic um, that we are not providing them, especially on the neighbor islands, with the care that they should have. Uh, I, I mean, to me, if I was a legislator, I'd be mighty impressed with that because, no secret, legislators get old, too. <laughs> I think, Jay, you're familiar with the statistic that Hawaii has got the fifth worst uh, population exodus, you know, uh, in the U.S., you know, as a percent of population. So uh, we're number five in people that are leaving the state. And there was in 2022, 15,000 people left the state of Hawaii. And, and, you know, some of them are younger or people with families and they, they needed to be able to find affordable housing or a job. But there's a fair number of people, too, on the, on the neighbor islands where they go, listen, I'm getting older uh, you know, a lot of these people, have, you know, are, are are dedicated members of the community. They belong to Rotary. They're, you know, they're trying to help at hospice and things like that. But they go, listen, there's nobody here to take care of me. And I'm not going to know that, that there isn't anybody. And so I'm, I'm going to leave before I get sick or, you yeah. know, while I need care. Uh, and that's unfortunate. I, I, I'm a breast cancer specialist. And, you know, Breast cancer is really very treatable if you catch it in the early stages. I mean, the cure rate is fantastic, but if you wait too long and it spreads to the lymph nodes of the rest of the body, uh, often we don't have the ability to cure that, and often you're just buying time. And uh, literally every week or two for the last couple of years, I've been watching people walk into the clinic. Uh, some of them are older, but some of them are in their 30s and 40s, and they've got palpable breast masses that they've known about for six months, 12 months or longer. Uh, and they say, well, I, I looked, you know, I, I called 10 or 15 or 20, you know, provider groups hoping that I could get an appointment and their panels are awful. I couldn't find anybody to take care of me. And sometimes they actually go into urgent care or ERs, you know, for evaluation of a breast mass. But unfortunately, a lot of these women after, you know, putting on, having their care put off because they couldn't access care, you know, in, in, in East Hawaii, by the time they come in, they've got, you know, lymph nodes that have got the disease in it. Uh, and, you know, that's a tough conversation to have with people, you know, when they're, especially if they're younger, you know, and they're in there and their kids are in the waiting room and you're trying to explain to somebody who's, who's 42 or whatever that, you know, your cancer is spread to the, to the lymph nodes and we'll do the best we can. But it, you kind of know that it's, it's, you can't often cure these individuals, at least not with our current technology. Yeah. Oh, what tragedy. Uh, on a on a, an individual patient scale and on a community scale. Seems to me, though, that you're doing a very important thing. You're, you're talking about this, Scott. You're making people aware, not just the legislators and the health officials, um, but people in general, the public. And I think the public has to be aware, A, of the problem, B, how it affects them and their lives and their children, who often leave because of this, and see what can be done about it. So you you mentioned um, you know the initiative to try to uh, ex exempt uh, medical services from the gross excise tax, and uh, maybe make it a little easier to do Medicare Medicaid work. But what else? What else would you like to have? If I made you the king of health in the state of Hawaii with unlimited power, power power to 
you know, reverse anything that anybody else did, what would you do? Uh, the first thing I do is was just to, to, to if you're in a hole, they always say the you know the best thing to do is stop digging. You know, so if we're losing people because of our tax structure, let's change it. You know, I mean, if, if people have, you know have got a high income, then you tax them with you know with with one of the highest uh, personal income tax rates in the country. But don't prevent hospitals and and medical practices from even being profitable in the first place. That's a recipe for disaster, and I think that one's kind of a no brainer. The second thing is that a lot of people are saying that the level of administrative burden has just gotten way out of, out of control. There was one recent study that was done which said that the majority of, uh, of doctors in America were spending between 10 and 20 hours a week doing what's called prior authorization. Uh, and that's where they're they're seeing their patients. They're making decisions that we you need this medication. We're recommending that this is you know the surgical course of action, or we want to you know have you know this rehabilitation process. You know these are people that have gone through tremendous levels of training. I mean you know it's it exceeds that of an airline pilot when you take a look at the decades it takes to to learn your craft in these areas. Um, and then the insurance companies, you know, they put all these prior authorizations, which basically mean we're going to second guess you. We're going to second guess you if you want to give this vaccine. We're going to second guess you if you want this medicine. We're going to second guess you if you're going to support your patient in, in, in getting a hip replacement because they can't walk anymore because of severe osteoarthritis. They're going to second guess everything you do just basically to block it, you know, and, and, uh, and then at some point in time, some of those will be approved. But if you are I mean, I don't know anybody here that works a 40-hour work week. I mean, most people are working, you know, often 60 or more hours a week. Uh, again, sometimes when they're into their 60s or 70s. But, you know, if you're, if you're wasting, you know, 10 or 20 or 24 hours a week, you know, jumping through these administrative hoops, that just doesn't make any sense. Now, the American Medical Association put together what they call their their, you know, their, their model bill, where we basically it's common sense kind of things. You know, if it's an urgent thing and you do have a pre-authorization process in effect, you know, you have to basically make a decision within, you know, 48 hours. And these decisions, you know, that are made on your, uh, uh, for, for patients in the state of Hawaii have to be made in the state of Hawaii by, by a doctor who's, you know, at, at least as well trained as the person that, 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 they're, that they're looking at. You know, often right now, if you're getting a denial, they're sending it off to some uh, some ancillary person who may not even have, you know, very much medical training, you know, sitting at, at, at a desk in New Jersey, you know, blocking things for people in Hawaii. So we, we have asked the uh, state legislature, uh, the Senate Health um, and the House, you know, committees that are, are involved with health care to introduce the American uh, Medical Association's prior authorization model bill. We think that could be a very positive uh, thing. It could, you know, if you've got a huge shortage of healthcare providers, why not make them as efficient as possible? Uh, and there's been a lot of studies that show that, you know, that, that you, you're, you're actually, you're, gonna, you're not hurting care. You're going to improve care for many of your patients if you allow them to get, get their care in a timely manner in conjunction with what their healthcare professional needs, thinks they need. Uh, one other thing before we go, and that is, uh, I've heard uh, from people on the mainland that um, they go get a doctor who will bypass all of that, uh, and um, the doctor will be mm, on, on contract with them, um, and he will be mm, available, or she will be available many time, and uh, come and give them, you know, special attention, special treatment, uh, in the way of a primary, I suppose. Uh, at a at a fixed cost that's not deductible, that's not part of insurance, and you just pay, I guess, annually. What do you think of that? Is that happening here? Um, is that worth considering? Can we encourage that, or should we not encourage that? Um, it is happening here. Uh, it's called it's concierge. 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 Yeah. 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 And. Uh, you know, exactly as you pointed out, you know, rather than deal with all the, the insurance company hassles and, you know, the, the overhead that comes from, you know, running care through through insurance companies, which take their big, of course, uh, sometimes pretty substantially. Um, and instead, you just have a contract between you and the person taking care of you and they commit to take care of you and you, you, you pay them on a monthly basis or whatever. And so there is some of that taking place. And I, I think it does have its place. And I you know, if it's a choice between, you know, healthcare providers who are unable to make it in our current system, you know, fee-for-service, and they're leaving the state, I'd rather have 
here and taking care of those patients who are able you know, to, to come to these arrangements with them. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that you know, we have you know, over half of our state's population is on Medicaid and Medicare, you know, over half. And uh, we have a large uh, contingent of uh, veterans in the state of Hawaii, of which I'm one. And, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of these folks, they, they cannot afford, you know, that extra out-of-pocket expense. Um, and so while that might be a solution um, that's, that's appropriate and reasonable for some providers and some, uh, some professionals uh, or, or patients, you, you just, you can't write off the huge portion of our population that, that for which that's not available and who couldn't afford it even if they wanted to do that. Yeah. We've got to think about the larger picture, the larger population, the larger sense of um, comfort and health and confidence in the future, and and the failure of um, of the government to provide adequate healthcare personnel and services uh, affects that. So I wish you good luck this session, as all sessions, and I hope you can um, advocate and find find sympathy, if you will, uh, with every legislator involved. Thank you very much, Scott, for coming on our show. I hope we can check back with you as the session unfolds and see how things are going. Well, I'm, I'm optimistic, Jay. We, we have a physician uh, governor who, uh, you know, Dr. Josh Green, who, who's got eyes on this problem, is, is intimately familiar with it, having worked as, you know, in, in primary care and urgent care centers on the Big Island uh, we have a lot of very smart people like Dr. Lewin of Shipta and uh, Congresswoman Takuda, uh, you know, that are, are understand the problem and are helping us try to find solutions. The mayors, I, I think, are starting to come around and realize how important it is, even for their economy, to have a, a functioning, viable healthcare system. And so, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's work together. Let's make it happen. Thank you, Scott. Dr. Scott Grosskreutz, we really appreciate you coming on. Aloha. Aloha, Jay.